This week on the show, we have control flow identity with hardened BSD, fixing the buffer bloat problem with OpenBSD's PF, Barrios backup server on FreeBSD tutorial, a MeetBSD call for papers out, and crypto simplified interfaces, as well as Twitter gems, interesting BSD commits, and much more in this week's episode of BSD. Now! BSD Now, episode 254, Bear the OS, recorded on the 11th of July, 2018. Alan's chuckling, but I'm Benedict Reuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. <laughs> and I'm not yeah, impressed it's with another week. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it's time for the headlines. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, we start a little bit on the funny side here, um, but there's still news to read out in this week's episode. Uh, cross DSO, CFI, and hardened BSD is something we've heard on the hardened BSD uh, GitHub, which is probably their blog. And uh, what's this cross DSO, CFI thing, you ask? It's control flow integrity, or CFI, uh, which raises the bar for attackers aiming to hijack control flow and execute arbitrary code. The LLVM compiler toolchain included and used by default in Harden BSD 12, uh, current on AMD 64 systems, supports forward edge CFI. Backward edge CFI support is gained via a tangential feature called safe stack. So cross DSO CFI builds upon ASLR and packs no execution for effectiveness. And Harden BSD supports uh, the uh, non DSO CFO, uh, CFI and base and has it uh, enabled for a few individual ports already. And the term non-cross DSO CFI, so we have all kinds of abbreviations here, uh, means that CFI is enabled for code with an application's code base, but not for the shared libraries it depends on. Supporting non-DSO CFI is an important initial milestone for supporting cross DSO CFI, or CFI applied to both the shared libraries and applications. And here, uh, the article discusses uh, Harden BSD, how it stands against or with regards to cross DSO CFI and base. And they made a lot of progress, uh, yet they're not even halfway there. But this is basically to give people an idea what this is all about. So brace yourselves, they write. This article is going to be full of references to cross DSO CFI. Make a drinking game out of, drinking game out of it. Or don't. Well, it's your call. So... <laughs> Uh, using more LLVM toolchain components is the uh, section title here. Uh, CFI requires compiling source files with link time optimization, known as LTO. Uh, I remember hearing a few years back that LLVM developers were able to compile the entirety of FreeBSD's source code with LTO, and compiling with that produces intermediate object files as LLVM in IR bitcode uh, instead of ELF objects. And in March 2017, it's, it's been a while. Uh, they started compiling all applications with LTO and non-cross DSO CFI, which also enables LD.LLD as the default linker in base since CFI requires LLD. So this is all part of the uh, LLVM toolchain. Right, and I think LD.LLD is the default on FreeBSD on AMD64 and I think ARM64 as of like a month ago or so, I think. Yeah, that was a big effort, and uh, we thank the people for that. And that pretty much enabled um, things like this cross DSO CFI, among other things. And uh, building libraries with the base requires uh, applications like AR, uh, Randlib, NM, and Objdump. In FreeBSD 12 all, current... Uh, those are all tools that you use to, to actually compile uh, the system in the libraries and link them together. Yep. And uh, these are known as BSD AR and BSD RANLIP. In fact, AR and RANLIP are the same applications. One is hard linked to another, and the application changes behavior depending on the argument vector, the first entry in the array, ending with RANLIP. The AR, NM, and Objdump used in FreeBSD do not support LLVM IR bitcode object files. And so in preparation for the cross DSO CFI support, uh, the committed Harden BSD linked in the show notes here in October 2017 saw Harden BSD switching AR, Randlib, NM, and Objdump to their respective LLVM components. And uh, those versions, due uh, to support the LLVM IR bitcode object files, 
surprise. Uh, there have been some fallout in the ports tree, and we've uh, added LLVM AR unsafe and friends to help transition those ports. That is like LLVM AR, LLVM Randlib, NM, and LLVM ObjectUp. And so with these uh, libraries here and, and uh, object files, uh, LLVM object dump default HardenBSD has effectively switched to a full LLVM compiler tool chain in 12 current on AMD 64. Right, so that's replacing more of the current BSD-based tools with the LLVM ones uh, because you need all those working together to, to provide that uh, the link time optimization support via the intermediate format. Yep. And the primary 12 current development branch in HardenBSD uh, only builds applications with link time optimizations, as mentioned in the section above. And uh, the first attempt they did at building all static and shared libraries failed due to issues with LLVM itself. So um, those were reported back to FreeBSD, uh, HardenBSD's upstream. And at mass, Dimitri Andrich and LLVM's Rafael Espindola expertly helped address these issues. Various commits within the LLVM project by Rafael uh, fully and quickly resolved the issues, brought it up privately in emails. Oh, excellent. That's kind of a nice uh, cross-project um, collaboration here, benefiting everyone. Uh, with LLVM fixed, uh, they could now build nearly every library in base with LTO. Uh, and, and they noticed, however, that if they kept non-cross DSO, CFI, and SafeStack enabled, all applications would segfault even simplistic applications like bin ls. Oops, that's not good. Uh, so disabling both non-DSO, CFI, and safe stack, uh, but keeping LTO produced a fully functioning world, and they spent the last few months figuring out why uh, that is, or why enabling either non-cross DSO, CFI, or safe stack caused these issues, and this brings us to today. Uh, because the sanitizers in FreeBSD are uh, something here to mention, uh, they brought in all kinds of files uh, required for SafeStack and CFI into FreeBSD. Uh, when compiling with SafeStack, LLVM stati well, not statistically, <laughs> statically, they statically link all full sanitation frameworks into the application with FreeBSD, including a full copy of the sanitization framework in SafeStack, and that includes the common C++ sanitization namespaces. So the libclang uh, RT SafeStack includes code meant to be shared among all the sanitizers, not just SafeStack. And they, uh, the HardenBSD folks natively, or naively actually, uh, took the brute force approach to setting up the libclang uh, CFI static library and copied the makefile from libclang RT SafeStack and used that as a template for libclang RT CFI. With this approach, they uh, incorrectly did uh, a breaking of the one definition rule called ODR, and essentially they ended up ending or including a duplicate copy of the C++ classes sanitizer runtime in both CFI and SafeStack. Uh, yeah, very common in anything doing with make files, especially in ports and in the source tree. Um, people's first instinct is to grab the nearest thing that seems similar to what you're trying to do and then modify it instead of building something uh, clean and then you end up with weird side effects like oh this one brings in this whole copy of the other thing and I ended up doing that twice when I didn't mean to or you know it turns out people always seem to pick the worst possible example when they're going to copy and paste something mm, yeah it's the same for I, I'm sure there's a pages. name I'm, I'm sure there's a name for so and so's law about if, if people are going to copy from one of the existing examples, they will pick the worst possible one. Yeah. <laughs> if you know that, uh, send this to us and we'll uh, complete this in, uh, in the next episode. Uh, yeah. So in um, the cross-DSO CFI development virtual machine they have, uh, they now enabled SafeStack. Um, oh, they nope. disabled SafeStack across the board. And they're now compiling uh, CFI only. And as of the 26th of March 2018, an LTOified world with libs and the applications, uh, they work with limited testing. Uh, the BinLS does not crash anymore. Excellent. And the second major milestone for cross DSO CFI has now been reached. So there's a section on known issues and limitations, of course, because this is not uh, done yet. And there are a couple of things need to. Uh, fleshed out. There are a few known issues and regressions. Note that this is a list uh, of known issues, essentially also which constitutes a work in progress and every known issue will be fixed prior to the official launch of the cross DSO CFI. It seems LLVM does not like statically compiling applications with LTO that have a mixture of C and C++ code. 
So SBIN DevD is one of these applications that has both. As such, when cross DSO CFI is enabled and DevD is compiled as a position independent executable uh, called PIE, uh, doing this breaks UFS systems where slash user is on a separate partition. Uh, they are currently looking into solving this issue to allow DevT to be statically compiled again. Uh, what? Why does it matter that UFS is a file system? I guess maybe the location of one of the libraries it's trying to include, but that that seems like an odd thing for DevD to have anything to do with your file system. Yeah, this, uh, huh, there's some kind of intertwining going on here. But um, the next issue is that no underscore shared is now unset in the tools build stage, known as bootstrap tools or cross tools. Uh, this is related to the static compilation issue above. Unsetting no shared for to tools uh, build stage is only a band-aid until they can resolve static compilation with LTO. The next item yeah, here um, is... Some of the things like that are compiled with no shared is because you really want them to be static. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Enforce that. Um, yeah, and one of the goals of the cross DSO CFI integration work is to be able to support the CFI call scheme when DL open and DL sim and the DL func uh, function calls are used. Uh, this means the runtime linker, LTLD, must be enhanced to know and care about the CFI runtime. This enhancement is not currently implemented, but is planned. And the last on the list. Uh, so far is when cross DSO CFI is enabled, safe stack is disabled. This is because compiling with cross DSO CFI brings in a second copy of the sanitizer runtime, violating the one definition rule or ODR. Resolving this issue should be straightforward. They unify the sanitizer runtime into a single common library that both cross DSO CFI and safe stack can link against. And when the installed world has cross DSO CFI enabled, performing a build world with cross DSO CFI disabled fails. This is somewhat related to the static compilation issue that we described above. Okay, so that's the current status here listed. Uh, they've managed to get a cross DSO CFI world booting on bare metal, their development laptop, and in the virtual machine. Some applications failed to work. Curiously, Firefox still worked, which also means Xorg works. Of course, yeah, can't have one without the other. Um, they're now working through the known issues list, researching and learning. And future work, uh, fixing pretty much everything in the known issues and limitations section, of course. Uh, they need to create a static library that includes only a single copy of the common sanitizer framework code. Applications compiled with CFI or SafeStack will then only have a single copy of the framework. And they will also need to integrate support in the RTLD for cross-DSO CFI. Don't forget the drinking game, by the way. Uh, applications with the off iCall scheme enabled that call functions resolved through DLSIM currently crash due to the lack of RTLD support. I need to make a design decision as to uh, whether to only support adding the iCall whitelist entries they write uh, only with DLFunk or also to whitelist CFI iCall entries with the more widely used DLSIM. And there's likely more items in the to-do buckets that they're not currently aware of. They're treating it as uncharted territory. They have no firm ETA of any bit in the work. Uh, they gain, they may gain cross DSO CFI support in 2018, but it's looking like it will be later in 2019 or 2020 even. And the conclusion for now is that they've been working on cross DSO CFI support in HardenBSD for a little over a year now. A lot of progress has been made. There's still some major hurdles to overcome. Uh, this work has already helped improve LLVM and hope uh, that more commits upstream to both FreeBSD and LLVM will happen. Yes, that will be good. And we're getting closer to being able to send out a preliminary call for testing. Okay, that's good. Um, at the very least, uh, they would like to solve the static linking issue prior to publishing the CFT and expect it to be published before the end of 2018. And they would especially like to thank Ed Mass, Dimitri Andrich, and Rafael Espindola for the help, guidance, and support. Oh, great. Yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. uh, thing to have. Uh, this week's episode of BSD Now is brought to you by IX Systems. Head over to ixsystems.com slash bsdnow and check out their open source storage is disrupting the enterprise market ebook. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you'll learn about how proprietary and cloud storage can fall short of what you can do with open source and why open source is a better development model for storage systems uh, and what the advantages are of using NVMe and NVDIM 
uh, to hybridize your storage to get better performance per dollar, uh, and why businesses need to have a unified data platform. You know, you don't want to end up with a bunch of data on this type of appliance and then some other data on that type of appliance, and then you can't move data back and forth, and you can't back them up, and you get locked in, and all kinds of unfunness. Yeah, because that is your important business data that you don't want to lose just because there's some data silo you cannot get into anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but iX Systems is just the right vendor for you to contact in case you want to uh, expand your storage or want to run uh, your uh, open source um, project or your open source um, application on a server and you just don't know which components are best and iX Systems are the people you need to talk to and they can tell you because they've built already a lot of systems like that. Yeah, like uh, just the other day, a friend asked me, you know, what's your favorite model of SAS JBOD? Uh, and I'm like, you mean the controller? And they're like, no, the, the shelf. I'm like, I, I don't have, um, this is the type of problem I don't have anymore. What I do is I call up my guy at IX and be like, I need this. And then I buy what they tell me to buy. <laughs> what, what are my options here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 15 years of server building experience, if it's taught me anything, it's been that just call IX saves me uh, all the headache. You know, hmm. when we first started Scale Engine, uh, we, you know, custom built our own servers and we ran into all kinds of interesting problems, um, you know, down to like the, the very first ZFS machine I bought. I bought a controller card that said right on the box supports FreeBSD but it only supported FreeBSD 8, and I wanted to use FreeBSD 9 because it had uh, newer ZFS with more features. Of course, yeah. Uh, and all kinds of problems that I would have been saved from if I had just called IX, and I would have got almost exactly the same hardware uh, because I, I bought Supermicro, and that's what IX sells. Um, but I would have got it, in the end, cheaper, and it would have worked the first time. Sure, yeah. Uh, so basically from then on, I've just called IX every time <laughs> and it's worked out much better. Yeah. And speaking of uh, ZFS, especially IX Systems employs a couple of uh, ZFS uh, people that uh, work on integrating ZFS uh, features into FreeBSD, not just um, making that work well on their systems, but pretty much upstreaming all their changes that they, that they have. And that's nice because they're not only just giving you the hardware, but also the software is um you know com working in conjunction with that yep yeah. uh, and uh speaking of that they just started releasing the first betas of freenas 11.2 oh exciting so uh if you want to try that out in a vm or something and and see how uh 11.2 beta works for you you can try it out yeah, this is nice. Uh, so the 11.2 beta will be the first version that includes the device removal support. Oh, that's what people have been looking for uh, because they just added this one disk and, uh, well, <laughs> want to get it back. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then probably in time for FreeNAS 11.3, maybe we'll have the RAID Z expansion work done by then. Oh, Yeah. Because these are all these things that people those, that have a storage system. Those two are system. the device removal is the <laughs> second most requested feature ever, and RAID Z expansion is the most requested feature ever. <laughs> yeah, and we're on the uh, on the verge of finishing that and integrating it yeah. so that people can make use of these. Yeah, and that's also partly because iX Systems uh, helped with that. And then and, you know, I'm working on a feature that everyone wants but they didn't know it. <laughs> Ooh, but can you tell us? Uh, <laughs> Per VDEV properties. Ah, so you can say so this, can this like is a bit. Z pool set no alloc equals on. Um, or, well, it'd be no alloc that... at the disk name equals on or whatever, uh, and be able to control things about the disks, but also be able to get a bunch of read only properties. So yep. just simply get, say, the serial number of the disk, um, all the data that comes out in that table when you do zpool status yeah imagine if you could do like zpool get uh, error count at da7 that disk oh uh, that would be yeah, great the disk name exactly oh wow that yeah I, it, it's kind of um so then 
in and your monitoring system yeah. wouldn't rely on you know piping z pool status into awk it could actually get the properties that you want mm. just the single ones without parsing yeah. the whole thing yeah, yeah and great then, and then you could write say a channel program that would spit it all out exactly the way you want with a couple of lines of code yeah oh yeah i can see myself uh, mm -hmm. seeing having a use for that okay yeah we're well, looking forward to that <laughs> but yeah so check out ix systems uh, give them a call if you're in the uh, market for a new server or looking for just a little bit of advice uh, for your next uh, machine okay our next news item is barrios backup server on freebsd Yes, uh, so Barrios stands for the Backup Archiving Recovery Open Sourced. Uh, basically a network-based uh, open source backup solution. Uh, it is a fork of Bacula. If you want to know a bit more about why it's a fork and so on, there's an explanation here in the story. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll get right to the guts of it here. Uh, this is from our friend uh, Vermidin on his blog, and he says, I started my sysmin job with backup systems as one of the new responsibilities. So it will be uh, like going back to the roots. Uh, as I look at the backup market, it is more and more popular, especially in cloud-oriented environments, to implement various uh, levels of protection like gold, silver, and bronze, for example. Uh, they, of course, have different retention times, numbers of backups kept, different RTO and RPOs. So RTO is your uh, recovery time objective, um, which is how long it's going to take to do the restore. And RPO is your recovery point objective, which is the backup you're rolling back to after a failure. Uh, how long ago was it? So how much data, how much new data got lost, right? So mm. if you take a backup once a day and you fail at five o'clock, that means you lost pretty everything that happened today. Whereas uh, if your objective is not to lose more than an hour, then you're going to have to have a backup every hour. And then, you know, if you fail at, at 4.30, all you've lost is everything that's happened since 4 o'clock. That's if you manage to back up the entire system or network um, at 4 o'clock in zero seconds. But it probably took a while at 4 o'clock. And then, yeah. you know, it gets complicated. Um Anyway, uh, so below is an example implementation of the bronze uh, level backups in Berrios. Uh, so there are three groups, A, B, and C, with a full uh, backup starting on day zero. Okay. Uh, or in group two, the full backup actually happens on day two, uh, so that it's not happening at the same time. And then uh, the next day on group three. This way, you still have full backups quite often, but all three groups don't do their full backups on the same day. Um, yeah. And then Sounds good. For the days that are not doing a full backup, uh, then they do a differential backup. So a differential backup is basically everything that's changed since the last full backup, whereas mm -hmm. an incremental is everything that's changed since the last backup of any type. Yeah, whether it's full or... Uh, um, yeah, full of... Yeah, yeah, sure. So, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the difference is when you go to restore, if you have a differential, all you need is the last full and that differential, and that combined will get you back to where you're going. Whereas if you have an incremental, you have to have the previous backup, and then if it's an incremental, also the backup for that and the backup for mm -hmm. that until you get to a differential the next. Uh, and then a full or mm -hmm. incrementals all the way back to the full. Uh, if you end up needing, you know, eight different uh if you have to restore eight different backups to get your files back, then that can end up taking longer. But oh, yeah. the backups don't take as long, so it's you know getting the mix in there. Okay, that's actually a good strategy for people to follow as a, as a schema. Yeah. Ah, and so that's why they prefer differentials here because you get faster recovery, uh, but. The backups do take longer. It depends on your rate of change and a bunch of other things, what makes most sense for you. Mm. Uh, often it's backups uh, full once a quarter, a differential once a week, and incrementals daily, which means you'll never have to restore more than eight backups. Uh, but you know, even eight can be a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so maybe you have the full once a week, uh, differentials once a day, and then incrementals once an hour. But the, even then, that's you know a lot of backups 
you know, you're going to need the, a lot of space to store all those backups. The, the so data has to go somewhere. So problem yeah. solved, right? <laughs> uh, so the implementation of bronze in these three groups is not perfect, but it does the job. Uh, it, you know, it's also just a simulation here as an example. And barriers and we can see that in the end, that. we end up with uh, a retention of 62 monthlies uh, and seven dailies. Uh, and then they show some other examples here and more graphs. Anyway, uh, but importantly for the tutorial, Today, they're going to show you how to install and configure it on a FreeBSD system so that you can actually start doing your backups. So there are four parts uh, to Berios. There's the director, um, which actually controls who gets backed up and when. The storage daemon, uh, which is where you do the backup to, so it's where the storage is. Uh, the web UI, which lets you control it. And the file daemon, which is the client that goes on the machines that you want to back up. Uh, technically all of these can be on one machine but oftentimes you'll have uh, one director multiple storage daemons which are basically either your tape decks or your ZFS storage arrays or whatever and then the file direct, uh, file daemon goes on all the computers you want to back up so you know there's a Windows client, a Unix client, a Mac client and so on and then you got your VMware and your cloud and your SQL server and all that and then the director says hey grab that data and send it to the storage daemon, which then writes it to the tape or the disk. Uh, or it can even do um, spool to disk. So because disks are faster, you do the backup over the network to the disk to get it finished, and then over time, write it out to the slower tape drive. Yep, so it trickles down. Yeah. And then there's a web UI where you can control it all from your browser. Oh, nice. So uh, the tutorial assumes that in order to provide uh, storage space for the backup data itself, you need to mount the resources from, say, external NFS shares. Um, to get in touch with the BarrowS uh, terminology and technology, check their great manual, which is in HTML or PDF versions, whichever you prefer to read. Uh, also, this diagram that I just showed uh, could be useful for figuring out what goes where. So, uh, first system. As every system needs to have its name, uh, and we use the Latin word closest to our backup here, replica, uh, for our FreeBSD system hostname. So just do a regular FreeBSD install on it. Uh, and once you get to the login prompt, then you want to start doing the fun stuff. So configure your network, enable your various daemons that you want or whatever, and then you can see there's the new parts for Berios here. Uh, Berios uses uh, an SQL database to keep track of all the files and the lists of backups and so on. Uh, so you can use Postgres or MySQL or whatever. And in this example, they're using Postgres. And then on this machine, they're actually running the director, the storage daemon, and the file daemon all on one machine, uh, which is often what you would do if you only have one server to do the backups. And you actually want to back up your backup server. Uh, yeah, that's that can also fail and break yeah. and need need restoring. Uh, so once we have all the core services of BarrowS uh, set up, um, we can just do the configuration that's needed. Um, there's a couple a bit of tweaking here to make um, Postgres work nicely with the shared memory and so on. But once you have your system configured, we can start installing things. Uh, so they set up their primary and secondary and their uh, make a host file defining the three different machines they're gonna have uh, and make sure that they can ping those and connect to them. And then they start with their packages. Uh, in this case, they actually switch from the quarterly branch to the latest branch of ports. Uh, and then they can install the Bear OS client and server and so on. Uh, so they actually installed quite a list of things here, uh, but the Bear OS server, the web UI, the Postgres server, a web server, and all the PHP stuff they need to make the UI work. Uh, then they set up their Postgres database and get that going. Uh, 
and enable Postgres, and then make sure that they're, uh, they run the Postgres init DB and actually create the database. And then start Postgres. Uh, and then they install BarrowS uh, and get its configuration file sorted out. They define the catalog, which is basically the, the Postgres server where you're going to keep all the information about what's backed up and where. So they get that going uh, with Postgres and import all the uh, the table layouts uh, for the BarrowS stuff. And then they vacuum their uh, Postgres database to <laughs> clean it up. Uh, and then they need to configure the storage. So in this case, uh, they're actually going to be doing the backups over NFS, uh, but you could also do it to local ZFS or to tape or whatever. It's all covered in the back of the manual or the BarrowS manual. Um, so once you've created uh, where you want to store your files, then you start configuring it. So in addition to your catalog, which connects to the database, you also define uh, for your storage daemon and your file daemons, you have to define where the directory is so you can connect to it and talk to it. In the directory, you configure it with its passwords and, and its configuration. Uh, and then you create a default restore job to let you uh, define what the defaults are when you're restoring files. Uh, the defaults for clients when you're backing up files. Um, and then you can create a special config file for um, the backup server so as a client so that it can connect to itself and back up its own files. You know, if after you spend all the time making these config files, you're going to want to back them up so you don't have to do it a second time, right? It's uh, Yeah, these are important files now that you want to keep. <laughs> uh, so then we make a job to back up the catalog so that Postgres database is safe as well. And then we create... Uh, basic configs, and then we have to create the pools that we're going to do our backups into. Okay. So they create uh, two of our pools, one called daily and one called monthly. And then they create a cycle schedule that says, you know, run a full backup on the first Saturday at uh, 9 p.m., uh, then run a differential on every other Saturday at 9 p.m., uh, they're all, they're all the remaining Saturdays, sorry. Uh, and then run an incremental each Monday through Friday at 9 p.m. So this way, you'll take a full backup on the first Saturday, and then you'll take an incremental backup every weekday, and a differential every weekend that's not the full backup weekend. And in this way, uh, you'll have your objective of being able to restore to any day of the week uh, with loss of less than a day of work and um, without having to do more than uh, seven backup files. Uh, and this, the reason why there's no backup run on Sunday is the backup probably runs from Saturday night all the way through Sunday. Yeah, and that takes some time. Backup. Yeah. And then we create the storage daemon uh, setup so that we tell the clients where to go and write the files to. And we create the file set that says which files we want to back up. So the back of the director has a list of paths and includes and excludes uh, and optionally the compression settings to decide which files on each of the clients that you want to back up to it. So you can do that. And then once you have all your file sets configured, for example, you can have a different file set for Windows where you can say, you know, uh, backup almost everything, but don't back up the recycle folder or the page file on all the Windows boxes. I don't really need to, you know, download an eight gig swap file from each Windows machine and, and store it on my backups, do I? <laughs> um, in addition to compression, um, Bacula can also calculate a checksum of each file, so MD5 or SHA or whatever, um, and then you can verify those files later. Um, so you can also use it for a, an intrusion detection type system where you actually 
just scan a computer calculating the hashes of the files and tell, hey, this system file that wasn't supposed to have changed has changed. Maybe something is wrong. Yeah, you might want to check on that just in case. Yep. You can also tell it which file system types to back up and which ones not to. So you can say, you know, back up any UFS or ZFS or EXT, whatever, uh, but don't back up NFS because we'll back that up from the NFS server instead of doing it over NFS. <laughs> and so on. And once you have all that, um, and you get the daemons running, you can start, it'll start doing your backups for you. Hmm. Nice. So that's good to have uh, proper backups. Mm -hmm. And then to configure the web UI, uh, you just configure your Nginx uh, to point it to, you know, user local triple W barrel S web UI slash public, uh, and configure that with your fast CGI so that you can execute the PHP code. Uh, and then you set your time zone and then configure the PHP FPM. And once all that's started, you'll be able to log into the web server. And uh, it even goes through, you know, configuring the log rotation for the, uh, the logs uh, from the web server. And then it's alive. It's working. And once they're all up, we should get the web UI here. So you log in, and then you can see the jobs that you've created, which ones are running, which ones are waiting to run, and so on. So then we start scheduling the uh, bronze job that we talked about. And once those are running, and we start doing a backup, we can see it in the web interface. Now oh, that also looks nice from the UI perspective here. Mm -hmm. Everything's and nice and clean. see that we're doing a daily backup uh, to replica.backup.org. And it's a full backup. And then as so it's complete, you'll get a graph of uh, how many of your jobs have started in the last 24 hours and how many of them finished and how many have problems and so on. And you end up with a complete backup solution. Yeah, very nice. So thanks to Vermadin for this very thorough uh, blog post here and the tutorial with the pictures and all the commands here. That's, that's good work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so what else do we have in this week's episode? Uh, we have found something that might be interesting for home users that have a router running OpenBSD or any other BSD because there's a, a thing called buffer bloat. So the article goes, uh, fixing buffer bloat on your home network with OpenBSD 6.2 or newer. And this is over at Paul Adam Smith's blog. So that goes, uh, my home network, which is also my home my work network is a standard issue Comcast cable hookup. In spite of a tolerance 120 megabytes down, my experience of daily internet use is regularly frustrating. Video streams and video chats drop in quality inexplicably. In, inexplicably, sorry. Uh, SSH sessions become laggy. Web pages fail to load quickly and then seem to appear all at once. Even though I should have plenty of bandwidth, the feeling is often one of slowness, waiting, data struggling to get through the pipes. The reason for this is a phenomenon called buffer bloat. I'm not going to explain it in detail. There are plenty of good resources to read about it, including the eponymous bufferbloat.net. So, uh, but in brief, buffer bloat is the result of complex interactions between the software and hardware systems routing traffic through the internet. It causes higher latency in networks, even ones with plenty of bandwidth. In a nutshell, software queues in our routers are not letting certain packets through fast enough to ensure that things feel interactive and responsive. Pings, TCP, acts, SSH connections, all are being held up behind a long line of packets that may not need to be delivered with the same urgency. There's enough bandwidth to process the queue. The trick is to do it more quickly and more fairly. Fortunately, because buffer bloat is a part of a function of how we configure our routers, it's within our ability to solve that problem. But first, we have to diagnose it and establish a concrete baseline to improve from, because otherwise you would have no way of telling whether it got better or worse. 
And so there's a speed test at DSL report, so pretty much any speed test you can do. Uh, for buffer upload and addition download, in addition, download and upload speeds, we'll use that tool to see how we're doing. So yeah, you can so, see a screenshot. You know, many speed tests will, will test your upload and download speed. Uh, but this one also looks at the variation of the latency of pings to the uh, a number of the speed test servers while you're downloading at your top speed. Uh, and as you can see in the graphic here, uh, during downloading, the buffer bloat uh, causes their ping to jump up to over 700 milliseconds while they're downloading. Yeah, Whereas, and that gives them... <laughs> yeah, it basically means they're actually trying to download faster than the maximum speed they can download, and so along the chain of traffic coming into them, there are machines that are holding a bunch more data waiting to send to them, so that when a new message comes in, it gets stuck in line behind this data that's uh, pending. Whereas if the network was tuned correctly, we wouldn't have told the sender to send us more data that quickly and the, the the line of people waiting to get through the choke point down to your computer would be smaller. And so when that ping response comes in, it would be at the end of a very short line instead of a very long line and would get to you sooner. Yeah, and uh, that will give you the better feeling of interactivity on the net. So as you can see, uh, the issue is starkly 120 megabytes per second down and 12 megabytes, megabits, sorry, megabits mm -hmm. per second. Uh, up yields an A plus grade, debatable, but we get a solid F for buffer bloat. So the, define, uh, the definition of buffer bloat here is uh, as the increased latency of a standard ping while downloading or uploading a larger file over ping times while otherwise quiescent. In our case, uh, our idle latency is 12 milliseconds average, a download bloat about 660 milliseconds, and an upload bloat of about 280 milliseconds on average. And so the fix is to apply a queue management strategy to our router. Ordinarily, uh, they'd be aware of this. Uh, in, well, Paul Adam Smith's experience here, uh, quality of service administration tends to be fuzzy and full of unintended consequences. Uh, he always felt uh, that he had uh, cast a too broad net, uh, inadvertently degrading overall network performance to get slightly better results from one application. And we're not sure around what fixed point he was optimizing, and in this case, off bloat gives us the measurable target. Administration is made much easier by the appearance of a new algorithm that's easy to apply to network interfaces. It doesn't require much tuning, and you don't need to futz around with individual ports or percentages. The details vary widely by router operating system administrative UIs, but in our case, the router is running OpenBSD. And it, if it's yours, isn't it? Why not get a PC Engines board, throw OpenBSD on it, and you have an inexpensive solution with world-class security, efficiency, and performance that's simple to operate and well-documented. So OpenBSD and their way is of uh, being a router is through its PF system, of course, which is analogous to Linux's IP tables that no one is using. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but much more capable and efficient. Since 6.2, PF has implemented something called FQ Codel, which is an algorithm for scheduling packets fairly and is designed to prevent buffer bloat. It is exposed via the flows option on a queue rule. In principle, all we need to do is add two rules, one to link, uh, one to fix the uplink buffer bloat and one to fix the downlink. And let's see how this goes. In your pf.conf, you first add a single line to handle the uplink. This will apply the FQ codel queue to the network interface attached to our van link or the wide area network uh, or the cable modem in our case. The way to think about it is FQ codel is a strategy applied to outbound packets only as they exit the interface. So even though the VAN interface is duplex up and down, in order to handle the downlink part, they'll need to apply it to the network interface connected to our LAN, which we'll do next. And here's a small uh, but important detail. In order for the Q algorithm to do its thing, it needs to know the bandwidth of the outbound link. That's that's why we did the speed test. Uh, according to Mike Belupov, uh, the implementer of Q, F FQ Codel in OpenBSD, uh, they need to specify a 90 to 95% of the available bandwidth. Fortunately, they just measured it. So that, we, that, that part we covered. Yeah, so, so you want to end up 
queuing with a little bit of, of, of headroom left. A, a breathing space, yeah. <laughs> the line to add to pfconf to fix the buffer bloat on the uplink is, uh, we basically create the queue. Out queue on EM0 flows uh, 10.24, bandwidth 11M, uh, that's max, yeah. Uh, max 11M, and then, yeah, queue limit 10.24 default. You have that in the show notes, so you can just copy it from there. A couple of notes here. Out queue is a label we give, but it's an opaque string to PF. 11M means megabits per second, as Alan said, 92% of the uplink bandwidth. Q limit is also specified explicitly because its default value of 50 is too low for FQ codel, and a default keyword is required. And that's it. We don't need to alter our filtering rules to assign packets to a queue. All outbound packets on this interface are assigned to a new queue. Now, let's reload PF with the config change and rerun the speed test. So, of course, you know how to do that with do s. And, of course, check your syntax first before you restart your firewall. Otherwise, you lock yourself out in worst cases. Um, And now we look at the speed profile again. And the grades we get here, the uplink latency under load is now down to 17 milliseconds from 280 milliseconds. That's already a big improvement. On the graph here, that there's no giant bar here and that the candlestick is very small Uh, yep and there's a mere five millisecond worse than idle Uh, they discount the apparent decrease in uplink bandwidth from this test result Uh, in their experience the uh, dsl reports could vary by 10 to 15 percent in reported bandwidth but um, uh, over time it converged to 12 megabits per second so you definitely see the improvement in your interactive uh, applications over the network the download the downlink fix is nearly the same we just adjust for the name of the interface uh, with the, which is the local area network nick uh, called em1 in this case and for its 90 to 95 percent bandwidth upper bound which is 110 megabits per second and you reload again after making that change and see what the speed test now tells you oh here we go buffer bloat now got a solid a for good or not affected not too much quality is still a plus and always nice to get an a download latency under load is now 24 milliseconds from 660 milliseconds so in closing they haven't delighted much i think that's a pretty decent result for two lines of config if you want to go further there's a quantum knob to turn baseline uh, for your nix mtu but look at what open wrt does for guidance but that's about it postfix uh, their observation is that things feel much snappier aside from the ping time improvements uh, they don't have other measurements to cite but so far fq codel seems to have fixed buffer bloats on their network and made for a substantial better experience Excellent. And it's super easy if you have PF running, then it's just more lines. Uh, two more lines. Uh, uh, hopefully you have the proper PF version uh, that implements the FQ code L. So, time for the news roundup this week. We have a story about crypto simplified interface. Yep, so this is over on the OpenBSD uh, journal on deadly.org. Uh, Joel Singh, or Jay Singh at OpenBSD.org, has recently committed the Crypto Simplified Interface, or CSI. So uh, this is a code base that intends to provide a simplified interface for mid-level cryptographic operations. In due course, various applications in OpenBSD and the libraries will be able to benefit from a clean and robust API rather than using things like libcrypto from OpenSSL uh, or other similar APIs directly. Uh, so the idea is it's kind of uh, in parallel with libtls to provide a simplified interface for other parts of uh, libcrypto, not just the TLS part. Okay. Uh, so over time, the idea is that this will provide a, a much nicer API for doing a bunch of the crypto stuff we currently rely on uh, OpenSSL for, uh, I'm guessing via Libre uh, SSL. Yeah, that would make sense to uh, for the OpenBSD folks to add that. Yeah, uh, you know, their biggest complaint is the API, and so they're going to make their own. <laughs> yeah, that was inevitable, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, libtls looks a lot nicer than how you do it in OpenSSL. Uh, so hopefully uh, this libcsi also does the same for the non-TLS bits. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, 
we'll watch this uh, and see where mm-hmm. uh, there's new news in the future. This week's episode of BSD Now is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head over to digitalocean.com uh, and sign up, and you can get a free BSD machine off in the cloud uh, for as little as $5 a month. Uh, if you use the coupon code FREEBSD now, they'll also add a $10 credit to your account to help you get started. But if you don't already have an account, you're in luck. We have a special deal. If you head over to do.co slash BSD now, they'll give you a $100 credit for 60 days uh, to try it out uh, and decide that it's the right solution for you. Yep. And that's certainly a great deal to start with because you can run so many things on DigitalOcean, whether it's a lot of one-click applications like uh, GitLab, your own MongoDB instance, MySQL, or you just basically get the operating system and run your own things. Yeah, like you have one. What do you use it for? I use it as my little... um, control hub for uh, Quasal, which is an IRC client, to stay pretty much online <laughs> the whole time. And I also use it to do SSA jump hosting, or when I'm at a conference or in a hotel that uh, only has unprotected Wi-Fi, I just, you know, do the SSL, SSH forwarding via that machine. It's a bit slower, but it's secure. And that's yeah, definitely well, better. Well, because you can get them from so many different locations, too, you can get one that's close by. Yeah, uh, it's Say I'm going to Asia, uh, which I'm not currently doing, but let's follow me on that. Uh, I just run that machine during the time in the Asian region that they have in DigitalOcean. Yep. And that only runs during the time when I'm there. And then I went on the airport on the flight back. I kill that machine. And I use that machine only when I'm there and only get billed for that period. Yeah, like the the smallest instance uh, is a gig of RAM and one virtual CPU, 25 gigabytes of SSD back storage, and a terabyte of internet transfer for $5 a month. But Uh, actually only pay for it hourly. So having it on for a week while you're in a foreign country, uh, super cheap. Yeah, and you have the the security, um, and and it's actually quite closer... um, and you don't have to, you know, carry the packets around half of around the world to to reach your computer. Yeah, uh, I have way too many droplets. Uh, <laughs> one's a backup mail server uh, for some stuff. Uh, one's our status page, so that we have a, a page not hosted by us that we can point people to in, during maintenances and so on. Um, I have another one that's uh, a mail server, web server for a different domain. Um, I yeah, have lots yeah. And of you, different droplets. <laughs> and what I also uh, use the DigitalOcean website for is their community section because I mm-hmm. grab a couple of uh, tutorials from there if I start out with something new and I just want to see um, how it's been done and I compare notes and then I can get started with something easier rather than trying to uh, to try it on myself. And so the community section has um, tutorials from people that I also being paid by DigitalOcean to write these tutorials or if you send them one and they like it, they will publish it there and you can get all kinds of things uh, on tutorial-wise, how to configure a VNC or uh, run I think your Jenkins. As of today, or, they have 1,947 tutorials. Yeah, there should be something in there for you. They even have one, uh, some of those are written in Spanish, I saw, and so that should be easy for people to get started with. And plus, there's more. They have why they have uh, no, not Wi-Fi. They have firewalls and monitoring and all kinds of yes. team features. Uh, and in the last couple of weeks, we've covered how to run a free NAS on DigitalOcean, how to run a PFSense on DigitalOcean, uh, lots of stuff. And, yeah, know, looking so, at the tutorials here, just off the top of the list, how to secure Nginx with Let's Encrypt on FreeBSD, uh, how to SSH securely uh, with Kryptonite using DigitalOcean and FreeBSD. Um, how to install Lots of Git stuff. on FreeBSD. How to configure an encrypted ZFS pool with DigitalOcean block storage on FreeBSD. Yeah, so all these, and especially since they're running in the cloud, they are uh, secure because, you know, encryption and all that will, will make that happen. And the DigitalOcean folks also um, provide you with the management utilities to run it via API to control these many instances that you might have or just you know, 
if you don't use that machine anymore, then just shut it down and delete yeah. it and no one will miss it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and because all pricing is actually hourly pricing with a cap for monthly usage, it means that if you start up a droplet today, which is already one third of the way through the month, you're only going to pay two thirds of $5 for your droplet. That's that's fair. Exactly. Yes. Um, so head over there, do.co slash BSD now, or if you already have an account but haven't used a coupon code, go into your account and enter the coupon code FREEBSD now, and you'll get an extra $10 on us. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Uh, the conference uh, season is upon us, at least the ones for the second half of the year, and MeetBSD has issued their call for papers. So this is out. Uh, the uh, the MeetBSD page has been up for a while, but now they added the call for papers to it. Uh, so this is over at papercall.io slash MeetBSD2018. And important, uh, it closes on August 13, so 7 UTC, so the night yes, of uh, August 12. Yeah, so yeah, uh, it closes at 7 a.m. UTC on August 13th, but that's specifically so that if you are, say, in California, uh, that's actually midnight on August 12th. So uh, yeah. <laughs> it basically so, it closes on August 12th, <laughs> no matter where you are in the world. Uh, so don't be fooled and try to send it in on the 13th. You have to have it in by the 12th. So yeah, you have no, basically wait. about a month from now uh, to write 100 words. Um, so if you write just like four words a day, you'll get there in no time. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. We want to hear your, your great talk about any of the BSDs that you are working with and co doing cool stuff with it. And then you can, when once it's accepted, you can present it at MeetBSD. And what is MeetBSD, you ask? Uh, it is a mixed unconference format event featuring both scheduled talks and community-driven events such as birds of a feather feedings, meetings, and speed geeking sessions. MeetBSD can be traced back to its humble roots at a local workshop for BSD developers and users hosted annually in Poland since 2004. And since then, MeetBSD has grown into its own conference with participants from around the world. And uh, the little history they have here, that so this conference happens every two years. And the first MeetBSD California was held at Google headquarters in 2008. The 2010, 2012, and 2014 and 2016 conferences were held at Hacker Dojo in Mountain View, Yahoo headquarters, Redstone Digital, and University of California in Berkeley, you might have heard about that one. Uh, so to this day, MeetBSD California continues to be a biennial tradition in the Silicon Valley with MeetBSD 2018 be hosted at Intel's campus in Santa Clara. Wow, isn't that a great venue? So definitely try to get in there. And they also opened the registration for that one. So you can mm -hmm. already register if you're planning to go. So I guess... Uh, uh, it's 100 euros uh, early bird, so don't let that pass you by. Euros? Uh, is it euro? Oh, no, sorry. Ah, <laughs> US, of course. <laughs> um, so don't miss that. Go to meetbsd.com and check out the conference. It will certainly be a nice thing to uh, close out the year of uh, BSD conferences. Yep. So now we are... Uh, having a little break Recently in this. A little new. <laughs> yeah, we're doing something new here. So instead of a normal, uh, regular news section here, we're doing something different now. And those were called Twitter gems. So what are those, Alan? Yes, so these are just tweets that we saw this week that we found interesting and thought we should share. Uh, the first one here from Real Gene Kim it says, an astonishing paper that may explain why it can be so difficult to patch your software. Uh, they monitored 400 of the most commonly used libraries, uh, and over the course of 116 days, they saw 282 breaking changes committed to those libraries. Uh, so that's each day, there's a 6.1% chance of a breaking change in a library that you might be using. Uh, oh, so wow. they said, by following a firehose interview method, we monitor 400 real-world Java libraries and frameworks hosted on GitHub during a 116-day period. During this period, we detected those 182, or sorry, 282 possibly breaking changes, uh, sent 102 emails, and received 56 responses, uh, which represented a response rate of 55%. Um, 
with the study, we provided the following contributions. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first large-scale field study uh, that reveals the reason of uh, concrete breaking changes introduced uh, by practitioners in the Java API. It'd be interesting to look at this from you know C libraries as well. Yeah, it's not just Java that has that. It's also other programming languages. And, of course, Gene Kim is someone you should definitely uh, follow because he's... Uh, very big in the DevOps space, um, writing up a lot of books uh, and co-authoring them uh, in the DevOps space. I'm currently reading another one um, authored by him, so that's certainly a, a very great uh, author to to follow. Yeah. Okay, and we have the official uh, Postgres SQL, uh, Postgres SQL. I don't know how you pronounce it. Postgres Postgres SQL. Um, Twitter account, <laughs> which is uh, sometimes what seems like a good idea isn't. The community has uh, collected a list of gotchas to be aware of on its wiki. Mm. Oh, don't do this, it's called. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah you, you... Things like don't use PSQL dash capital W, uh, and why not, and what should you do instead? Uh, don't use timestamps without a time zone. Uh, don't use money <laughs> as a value. Uh, uh, <laughs> Don't use uppercase table or column names. Uh, don't use the char uh, field type. Um, don't use uh, varchar by default. Uh, and don't use rules. And don't use the between operator on timestamps. Okay. So in uh, BSD terms or an operating system, at least Unix operating system terms, this would be don't use bin bash for shell scripts. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's great. From yep. the open, then we have uh, a follow-up to a, a note from the other day. Um, Tim Chase points out that on a recent BSD Now, uh, there was a listener uh, who asked about running BSD on their iBook G4. Um, Tim says he, he had a similar machine, the 1.5 gig of RAM G4 Snow, uh, but with the original hard drive, and it's currently running uh, OpenBSD 6.3 pretty well. So um, it turns out OpenBSD will work on that, and that likely means... Uh, you have a couple of options for operating systems there. Oh, it's not the end of the world. Oh, that's good. Uh, oh, yeah, the we next have, one. Uh, Vladimir Misiv, who points out uh, the interesting tool VT Font CVT, um, which allows you to make uh, the new VT console fonts uh, from any BDF font file. Uh, so he's created an Atari ST high resolution system font. Uh, and made that available as a font for FreeBSD 11.2. Yeah, if you want to have some nostalgia here, yeah, that's how it looks field. like. <laughs> that's very cool. And of course, you can use other fonts. So that yep. is a very nice tool to spice up your console. Yeah, uh, we talked about this one a little bit last week, but this is uh, the person who tweeted about their washing machine coming with a FreeBSD license in the manual. Um, but there's actually uh, quite a bit more to that thread now, and it's worth checking out if you uh, didn't check it out last week or even just looking at what's happened in that thread since then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's it's interesting what people uh, follow up with. And uh, Oh, then we have another one by uh, Sean Webb here. Uh, Today I learned Google's Chromium open source web browser, the core of the proprietary Chrome browser, contains more lines of code than FreeBSD World Plus kernel. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of scary looking at a browser and seeing, oh, this is much bigger code than a whole operating system. Um, and uh, another reply there says, arguably, it's also way more complex uh, operating system than FreeBSD is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I joke about Electron and so on in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting how code bases start to uh, expand. <laughs> Uh, okay. And this is uh, from the Changelog podcast. Uh, they have a capture here, um, and it says they must have gathered enough data on stop signs and storefronts. <laughs> if you use the um, the captcha one, yeah. If you've seen the captures from Google, oftentimes they're for to help train their machine learning. They're saying, you know, here's a picture. Click all the parts of the picture that contain a stop sign or the front of a store or a car or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But this example uh, is full of source code. And finally, click the one, click the lines above that have that contains bugs. Yeah. Uh, 
Although the interesting one I've started seeing in a couple of places, one that contains basically just graphical noise and a bunch of random symbols, and it's like click in this picture on or touch click or touch the part of this picture that is a key or a laptop or a house. Um, yeah. And it's all symbols. Mm. <laughs> Oops. But yeah, they're using that for, for a good purpose. Uh, I saw the, the very first capture ones. Um, they use that to actually do translations. Yep. So people would say, oh, what's this word? Or basically translate this word, which is a little blurry. And then you could basically from that, as many more people yes, they were, answered the same question. Uh, is, scanning books and, and translating them. Um, yep. And the other one was uh, when they used to have you pick um, names off street signs or the numbers off houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so guessing uh, source code bugs is probably the next thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this one's basically a, a retweet with some comments uh, from Canadian Brian, an OpenBSD user. Um, but uh, Filippo Valsorda says, I am now fighting a system where the get random call blocks, f uh, or get random zero bytes blocks forever, and the entropy available. Um, value it returns is always zero even <laughs> when the uptime is currently 431 days and of course there's no way to check if the entry pool has been initialized at all no <laughs> that's the type of thing that doesn't happen on FreeBSD because of the way our random system random number generator works it never runs out uh yep that's uh <clears throat> the, the way of uh, doing things on the bsds mm -hmm. Uh, I've also picked out uh, four of my favorite commits from the last week on, in FreeBSD. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the first one here is uh, some work committed by Kib after being submitted by uh, Thomas Monroe from Postgres. And it's, it adds a new set proc title underscore fast uh, call. So Postgres and a number of other applications change the name of the, or the title of the process. So when you look at it in top, uh, Postgres will actually keep updating its title to tell you what it's currently doing. So mm -hmm. then when you see Postgres using a lot of CPU, you know what it's doing or whatever. But it turned out that that was a bit of a bottleneck in FreeBSD uh, because it was changing it so frequently, especially now that we have you know, many cores and they're very fast. So uh, anyway, it says some applications, notably Postgres, want to call set proc title very frequently, and it's slow. So provide an alternative cheap way of updating the process title without making any syscalls, instead requiring other processes like top and PS to do a bit more work to retrieve that data. This uh, uses a pre-existing code path inherited from an ancient BSD, which always did it in that particular way. Um, so mm -hmm. use, reusing a, a currently disused system, it means top and PS will spend the small cost to go and get the current title from Postgres instead of Postgres spending the cost updating the title when maybe nobody's even looking. Yep. And so. uh, Postgres listed that on their blog as a kind of a, a thing they need to fix and now it's done. So yep. thanks for that. Uh, we're also, I'm helping investigate a set of issues with the uh, reusing the write-ahead log files. Uh, it turns out on ZFS, it's better to just create a fresh file instead of overwriting an old one in place, uh, yeah. especially if you have the wrong block sizes and so on. Um, and so I'm I'm working to change that uh, and make it better for FreeBSD. Oh, excellent. That uh, and then help. we have uh, another bit of code. I think originally part of it was from a Google Summer of Code and then more of the work was done by uh, Leon Dang uh, for a while. Anyway, this is adds NVMe device emulation to Beehive. Oh, so yes. The, the initial work uh, on Beehive NVMe device emulation was done by a GSOC student and then was heavily modified uh, for performance, functionality, and guest support by Leon Dang uh, and then reviewed by... Uh, Chuck Tufli and Peter Grehan and committed by Marcelo Arujo. Uh, so basically when you create a new device in Beehive, uh, you can specify the slot number and then the type as NVMe and then the path to the backing thing and set the maximum queue, the queue size, how many IO slots, the uh, sector size, and a serial number. Um, uh, including 
It has support for setting the device path to RAM equals and then some amount of RAM. And it will make a RAM disk as an NVMe device in the VM. Ooh, nice. And it's been tested with uh, FreeBSD 12, Linux, Fedora, uh, Core 27, Ubuntu 18.04, OpenZeus 15, and Windows Server 2016 Data Center Edition. Okay, that's a broad uh, operating system park here that's, that's supported. Uh, it's Great. been tested being backed by a real NVMe device, uh, uh, Zvol, uh, and RAM. And it okay. was also tested on both AMD and Intel. Even better. So yeah, that took some time uh, for testing and implementing, but now mm -hmm. it's there in Beehive. Yeah, uh, and so it can provide a much higher performance interface uh, especially, you know, you don't need to be emulating an old small SATA disk uh, when you actually have a giant fast array backing it. <laughs> and what's more? Next up, uh, we have uh, improvements to IPFW. Uh, so IPFW has added three new rule types, uh, record state, set limit, and defer action. So the record state is similar to keep state, uh, but it doesn't actually... Uh, have an extra opcode in it, so it just records uh, the state and doesn't actually have to probe. Uh, and then the set limit is similar to the limit keyword, but it's uh, similar to record state in that it uh, it's a single opcode without the implicit probe state opcode. And then lastly, the defer action is targeted at being used with dynamic rules or dynamic states. So when the rule with this opcode is matched, the rule's action will not actually be executed, but instead a dynamic state will be created, and then this state will be matched against future check state rules. Uh, then the rule action will be executed, and this allows you to make much more complicated rule sets, where when you match, you would actually do the work later on other packets that come in later. Mm. Yeah, I can see some use for that. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, submitted by LEV at freebc.org. Okay. And yeah, so thanks judging, for all that work. by the review number being in the uh, middle 1,000s, it's uh, <laughs> been in progress for a while. That's, uh, they've been at it for a while, yeah. But yeah, uh, thanks for everyone implemented that uh, or implementing all these features we just mentioned, and uh, we look forward to more. If we find interesting commits in other BSDs, uh, then send it to us at feedback at bsdnow.tv, and uh, we'll cover it in a future episode. If we have a couple of them, we can batch them together. Yep. And lastly, we have uh, adding support for TCP fast open uh, client side cookie cache printing. So a new sysctl, similar to the one for the TCP host cache, where you can print out each uh, client's IP address and what the uh, secret cookie is. Um, mostly useful for debugging. So TCP fast open uh, helps reduce the cost of making TCP connections. So normally when uh, a client wants to connect, uh, they send a, a SYN packet and they get a response back uh, with um, a bit of information and then they send the final part. So there's this three-way handshake where the packets go back and forth a bunch of times. Part of this helps prevent uh, spoofing because only if you got the reply to your first packet can you actually send the third packet to actually start setting up the connection. Um, but once you've done this once, you shouldn't have to do that same step every time you connect. Especially if, mm -hmm. say, you're... Um, doing video streaming and you're going to connect and download a bunch of video and then go away for a little while and then come back and download a bunch of video and then go away for a little while. If you were, say, you know, Netflix or something. Uh, so with TCP Fast Open, as part of um, the handshake, you get a cookie. Uh, that's basically a secret string. Um, and then when you go to make another connection to the same host later, uh, you include the magic cookie uh, and that proves that you're not spoofing. Uh, because you've already proved that you control the IP address uh, that you're coming from. Mm. Um, and then with that cookie, you can then open a new connection without doing the full three-way handshake. And over a high latency connection, that can save you know a lot of milliseconds and let you get that connection going a lot faster. It's also very helpful for things like uh, DNS over uh, TCP or over uh, HTTP. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and so uh, thank you to uh, Michael Tuxin for doing the work, Netflix for sponsoring, and Patrick Kelsey and Kevin Boulding for reviewing. So here are our itty bitty beastie bits this week, uh, starting out with Isotop, a French desktop orient OpenBSD distro. And uh, we're both sorry we cannot read anything from the website. <laughs> well, the picture's it's in, in English. French, of course. A um, secure spiny OS for your data. <laughs> uh, yep. uh, but yeah, it's basically a, a modified OpenBSD. Um, that's been pre-set up in French. Uh, it includes changes to Unbound, which is pre-configured for the resolution of something. Uh, Duaz has been uh, pre-configured for the utilization of the principle. <laughs> oh. uh, TK <laughs> menus uh, all set up for OpenBSD. Uh, an automatic montage of active peripherals are mounted ah so they have a slash vol that automatically uh mounts well, usb uh, states USB, yeah and stuff like that <laughs> hey, see we're getting at it <laughs> i can make fun of french as well as the next guy <laughs> um so there's that uh and uh so i guess telecharge mall probably means download <laughs> yeah get it from that URL and uh, yeah, try it out. But yeah, it's uh, an interesting um, choice of uh, you know combinations of operating system and making an, an, a distro that's centered to, uh, to the desktop. Yeah, um, and have French people. <laughs> yeah, so uh, why not? It's uh, it's a big country, yeah. or a lot of people speak French in the, uh, yes, in the world. Yes, uh, so. French is popular in a lot of yeah. places, not just France. Yep. <laughs> then we have uh, slides from um, BSD Patch, the Boring yeah. Healing Potion. Uh, so these are slides from FOSDEM 2018 uh, by Antoine Jacoteau, uh, and it talks a bit about SysPatch, the way they do patching uh, of installed systems on OpenBSD. Oh, nice. Uh, talk a bit about the Dark Ages before, where you basically just had to reinstall every time there was a new version. Then when M tier started providing uh, unofficial binary updates, and then the golden age is when syspatch started, meaning there were official uh, binary updates. Yeah. Oh, I, you can see that he put a lot of effort into the slides, not just putting in text there, but also <coughs> a couple of uh, nice pictures. Yeah, there's graphics and man pages, and oh, that's well worth a read. Yep. And oh, it's been already a while since uh, FOSDEM. Yep, it's, the yeah. video is out there somewhere for that one as well. And we should find the link and add it to the show notes. Mm. Uh, other news from Undeadly. We have the new grammar for the simple mail transfer protocol daemon. Uh, so yeah, they changed a, a little bit. What's changing uh, there? Uh -huh. So they have the action and the match. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked a little bit about this before, but uh, the new grammar is not too different from the former one. Uh, a lot of stuff remains exactly identical, but the rule set is now basically split into two parts. You have your named action and then your match that points to that action instead of having that as all one rule. Uh, it could allow them more flexibility for creating more advanced rules. Mm -hmm. And cool. then... Uh, I think we might have mentioned this one before as well. Uh, the LDAP client is now built into OpenBSD. So um, there's now an LDAP uh, command that you can use to connect to an LDAP server and get information. And there's also a recipe for using it with SSH in the authorized keys command. Uh, so you can go get a list of authorized keys out of your LDAP server and use that for authentication. Yeah. And if the LDAP server's down, no one can log in again. Uh, but the <laughs> but that's a different issue. But it's cool that to have that in OpenBSD as uh, mm -hmm. right with the operating system. This week's what? episode of BSD Now is brought to you by Tarsnap. Head over to tarsnap.com slash BSD Now and start doing your backups. It only takes $5 to get started. You probably should have done it when we told you to two years ago. 
Yeah, we, we, we keep getting at it because it's so important and because it's nice and easy and it's secure. You can rest easy that only you are holding the key and no one else can make any sense of the encrypted mumbo-jumbo that they found on AWS. Probably. Probably not. And as long as you keep that key, you are the only person who can restore your backups into a readable format. And it's not too much because they're also doing unique blocks out finding those out segmentation and deduplication and compressing those so it's much yeah, less to back only up. end up paying for the deduplicated compressed uh, changes to your files not everything uh, so you know your five dollars would probably last a while anyway oh yeah for you a don't while, want yeah. us to be able to point at you and say I told you so when you lose data so spend the five dollars and do a backup yeah Put it in cron and then you have something running in the background and you don't uh, think about it until the day you need it and then you're happy that you listened to us and you did that backup because then you can make a restore of all those important files that you don't want to lose. Uh, on all the operating systems you can think of, there's a client for Tarsnap, the Linuxes, the BSDs, Mac OS X, and Windows subsystem for Linux even. Yep. All right. Time for feedback and questions in this week's episode. So, a reminder, we need more feedback and questions. We only got three submissions for this week, so we need to fill up our archives of feedback and questions because otherwise this would be a very boring section. Nothing yeah, to talk like about. Nobody emailed us. Shame on you all. The end. <laughs> yeah, a, a quick episode end yeah, at this point. But we got three people, and uh, the first one is Nelson with ZFS and Arch Linux. Um, that goes like this. I learned yesterday about this project. This is uh, on the Arch Linux wiki about installing Arch Linux on ZFS. And while the broadcast centers on BSD family systems, it is nice to see documentation of using ZFS on the root file system on Arch Linux. Debian Linux promised a bootable system on ZFS about two years ago, but even the latest Debian 10.0 alpha still does not offer ZFS. Yes, the biggest problem on Linux is because ZFS isn't just part of their kernel, the version of ZFS and the version of the kernel get out of sync, and then you can't mount the file system when you try to boot. Uh, and they don't really have a solution to the problem. Uh, so Arch is in a slightly better position because things change on a regular basis instead of only every once in a while. Uh, and so they're better. It, people using Arch are used to rebuilding everything, uh, but yeah yeah so we're yes. lucky and actually BSDs. the chat room currently points out uh i'm not sure if the arch uh, wiki mentions it but i'd strongly advise people against uh trying to do zfs on root uh on linux right now because it's way too easy to break during distro updates because you end up with uh your kernel updated and not being able to load the older version of um zfs and then you can't mount your file system, and it makes it very hard to fix it as well. Um, yeah, so not not a good situation to be in. So yeah, uh, stick with the BSDs because they, or at least the FreeBSD, they got uh, ZFS nice support much coming, earlier. Because I, I know a number of people who envision a day where you have one ZFS pool and you use boot environments to switch between Linux and BSD. Yeah, that will be that will be great to have. And especially since pool can also be imported and exported on different systems, that will be such a such a great uh, future. Okay, uh, next up is Lars uh, with Rake Flutter about the OpenBSD tech list. Oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, so that goes, hello, JT, Alan, and Benedict. Here's a forwarded message for consideration for inclusion on the show. So this is on uh, tech at openbsd.org, their tech mailing list. Um, uh, Rake Flutter. Hmm? Uh, that goes, hi, when we develop code in OpenBSD, we have the choice of reviewing or sharing our patches privately between individual developers on an internal list or here on tech. From uh, OpenBSD's uh, mail, uh, they have an HTML website basically on OpenBSD.org. Uh, the description here goes, for tech, uh, discussion of technical topics for OpenBSD developers and advanced users. This is not a tech support forum. Do not use it as such. OpenBSD developers will often make patches to implement new features and other important changes available for public testing through this list. 
And when I share code on tech, it is intended to be reviewed and tested by the wider community, not just developers. I'm writing this mail because I get a lot of cheerful feedback about some features, like the recent HTTPD rewrite support, but almost no feedback on tech itself. In the rewrite case, people were asking me in private emails on GitHub, on Twitter, where is the feature or why does it take so long to review? Despite the fact that the latter made me angry, you are not my customer and this is voluntary work. I have the following request. So, uh, Rake wants you to know that. Please read tech at openbsd.org. Test diffs, share your thoughts, but keep the noise on MISC. Uh, don't be shy. Tech is not a list that is only for OpenBSD developers. If you are reading this list, you're probably already on a, an advanced user. So take some time and give us your feedback. Thanks, Reich. Yeah, so instead of complaining about how long it takes for stuff to get committed while you're waiting for review, uh, help test it, and that gets it reviewed. Yeah, we did it doesn't have to be in production. It has. To ha it can be a test virtual machine. I mean, VMM is is uh, the right thing in an OpenBSD land for that specifically. So, yeah, run a little test box and try it out. Because no feedback, then the developers have no way of knowing that it works. It no, may well, work on their. Might as well not bother then. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's an important um, call uh, from Reich here. So that is now reaching the wider BSD community. Okay, and uh, last is uh, Clem with Tarsnap, ZFS, and the FreeBSD question. So that's a bit longer and goes like this. Hey, guys, love the show. Been listening to it in the mornings on my drive to work. Okay, I hope we don't distract you too much. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, yeah, he's been playing around with Tarsnap on ZFS on FreeBSD and was wondering a couple things. Here's how I have things set up. My Atlas uh, called FreeBSD server uh, five, six terabyte drives, RAID Z1, Plex Media Server, Sonar, Radar, R, <laughs> and associated tidbits. Uh, my Tibet Arch server soon to be nuked in favor of another FreeBSD server used to mount NFS share and play shows. The OS 10 laptop and Windows laptop uh, workstation for, hem for family to want the clicky, clicky, pointy, pointy, uh, Apple TV, and a ubiquity edge router light. And each server and laptop runs Resilio Sync Pro, paid for it uh, way back, and its lifetime seems to work even though it's not free and I can't check the code. So I'm not sure if there's any funnies going on in there or not, but it's been working mostly. So anyways, using Resilio Sync, I've consolidated important documents, work time logos, spreadsheets, text files, music, etc. into separate folders and sync it across the local network between my servers. The nice thing about this is I can access any of this data from the spreadsheets on my phone using the Resilio Sync app. And it's backed up between all my machines and kept in sync. This drastically lowers the chance I'll lose it. Not to mention the added benefit one of the hosts is backed by ZFS and its checksums and redundancy goodness. Taking it one step further, why not? I heard you guys talking about Tarsnap, so I checked it out. I now take Tarsnap daily backups via cron of select folders. Documents and notes, information that I really don't want to lose. See, someone is listening. Um, <laughs> with all that background out of the way, here's my question. The ZFS dataset on FreeBSD, which holds the sync folder, has compression turned on. According to Tarsnap, type, uh, the tips page there says, I see um, the heading, don't use your own compression. You guys can probably see where this is going. Should I be using ZFS compression with Tarsnap? Does doing so increase the Tarsnap archive size? Or is the compression done by ZFS transparent to Tarsnap? Fingers crossed it is. Yes, so all the compression in ZFS is transparent. Uh, so when Tarsnap goes to read the file, it doesn't see the compression. Uh, what Tarsnap is talking about there is don't you know make a zip file of all the stuff you want to back up because when you then change that zip file, uh, it's much harder for Tarsnap to figure out what the differences are because they can cascade and they can end up uh, doing the differential backup of that zip file, can end up using a lot more space than if you had not compressed the files and let Tarsnap take care of it. But because all the ZFS compression is transparent to Tarsnap, it's still perfectly fine. Yep. And we can only tell you each week the cool things that Tarsnap does, but uh, having it read from a user or a, a reader, a listener from this show, it's much better. So it also he also writes, I'm seeing Tarsnap reports saying I have a total archive size of over 550 megabytes compressed down to something like 272 megabytes, which is wicked awesome. Yep. So uh, sorry. If you do um, 
ZFS get uh, compression ratio, and then the data set, you'll see uh, the compression ratio you're getting on ZFS on it and see how it compares. I'm guessing the tar snap compression, it will be better because it's slower. Right, and the ref compress ratio gives you exactly that compression for this specific data set, not the ones below it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he also continues, sorry if this has been covered in the past, as I've still got to uh, go a good chunk of your podcast to catch up on. Okay, well, we'll be here. They won't be uh, deleted in the future, so <laughs> they will be around. I always seem to collect too many hobbies between computers, ham radio, welding trade school, oh, wow, and University of Psychology. There's always something to keep up with now that I'm working on finding time to keep up with a challenge. It's nice to scratch that techno itch on my drive. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, if you or your listeners can think of any clever and useful ways to combine projects, be sure to let me know. I've got some interesting ideas kicking around. To see what kind of fun me and my magic boxes can get up to. Might just try stuff out and send in some more feedback. Always, uh, anyways, much love and beastie goodness coming to you from the west coast of Canada. Yeah, thank you. Great to see that you uh, enjoy our show and uh, tips we give you to uh, well do your backups, <laughs> if only that. And yeah, use ZFS, uh, you will be much better uh, for it yep. in the long run. Yeah, that pretty much ends our show. Again, send us questions, comments, any ideas on the show. If you liked our little uh, different sections that we had this time with the Twitter feeds and the uh, Beastie commits this week, um, send this to us and give us more feedback and questions for next week's episode and send all that to feedback at bsdnow.tv. See you next week.